dreams forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. -on -one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word, and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns forever. And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. Here we are, the first Sunday in March. Boy, 2018 is moving on rapidly. It's a real joy for me to be with you. I taped this on Tuesday morning. So right now, uh, I, Lord willing, I am in uh, Oklahoma City participating in their Training for Service series. There are 25 congregations in the Oklahoma City area that come together for a weekend Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and uh, I've been asked to be a part of that, and I'm really looking forward to it, and I want you to pray for my travel and for my efforts to try to encourage churches to grow, to try to encourage churches to reach out and do what they were established to do, and that was to make a difference in the lives of people. So thank you for your comments and prayers. I think I'm hearing more comments about the program now than I've ever heard. So some of you are taping it and playing it back on Sunday afternoon. Some of you are watching. Some of I was in a place of business and uh, that somebody said I was sick for a couple of weeks at home and watched the program and really, I'm sorry you were sick, but I do appreciate you watching the program. It's not about me. It's not about Mayfair, really. It's about the Lord and His Word. And that's the reason we're just kind of digging into what I think is one of the most needed books in, the new ta in, in our world today, and that's the book of Romans. Because we have the doctrine on one hand, and that's become a dirty word for some people. And then we have the duty on the other hand, and that also has become an ugly word. Uh, well, I don't want to go out of duty. Well, I do. I, I do a lot of things out of duty. Uh, because uh, the Lord told me to do it, because I know I need to do it. Uh, boy, that's, that, the reason, that's the reason I'm talking about it on Abundant Living is because people are, are just going totally by their feelings. Well, I don't like my job, then I quit. I don't like my marriage, well, I, I'll get another one. I don't like the situation. Uh, instead of cognitively thinking about it. And that's the reason the Lord says, I want you to love me with your mind. And we're going to get to that this morning. Uh, we ought to use our minds uh, in our relationship with the Lord. When you become a Christian, you don't throw your mind away. You don't just blindly start following what the Lord said. You know it makes sense. You know it's exactly what He wants you to do, and all you need to do is do it. So we're talking about the book of Romans and how it, it combines 11 chapters of doctrine, 11 chapters of the Gentile sin, the Jew sin, we all sin. Uh, we're, uh, Paul said, I struggle with my body in chapter 7, and they, we're led by the Holy Spirit in chapter 8. There's a powerful statement in chapter 9 where Paul said that... Um, uh, that he he wish he wishes that uh, his brethren would become Christians. He said that in chapter nine, also in chapter ten, and then we get to chapter twelve. It's like for eleven chapters he's been digging deeply into the doctrine of God, sanctification, justification, and now he gets to the the heavy word. He gets to service. On screen, we have the uh, website of those who uh, will sign up for World Bible School. And you know, that's what you and I have in common. It's just, it's just so wonderful that you and I can talk about the same thing, and that's the Word of God. And um, by the way, uh, I, you have sent in over $7,000 for Bibles for Cuba. And uh, those Bibles will, are being distributed 
and to people who've never had a Bible before. We were able to buy 15,000 Bibles for $45,000. And uh, your generosity, I love, uh, my secretary brings in uh, letters. I opened one letter the other day, had 15 $100 bills. No name, no address, uh, no way I can follow up other than by saying thank you so very much. Because with that $1,500, we'll be able to buy a number of Bibles and give them to people who've never had them before. And so that's what really abundant living is all about. It's not about me or, or what I think or what, <laughs> what you think. It's what does the Bible say? You know, you know, Hezekiah, one of the old men in the Old Testament, kept coming to the Lord saying, is there any word from the Lord? What he meant was, is there any new word from the Lord? And the Lord came, the prophet came back and said, no, you're still going to, uh, you know, you're still going to, going to be in captivity. You're still going to be captured in the of course, you had the Egyptian captivity, then you had the Assyrian captivity, and uh, then the two southern tribes were also sent into captivity. So then, is there any new word from the Lord? Well, it's new in the sense that a lot of people haven't found it yet, and they haven't put it into practice. So that's what we're trying to do in this, and, and when we, when we'll, we'll start this morning and uh, we'll just deal with uh, verses 1 and 2 because it is so full. The 12th chapter is about relationship. And I don't know of anything that's more important than relationship. A relationship is built upon trust. Uh, you become my friend. I become your friend. Uh, you become my friend whenever we learn to trust each other. Uh, we trust our doctors. We trust our uh, law enforcement people. We trust uh, our legal profession. We trust people to do what's best for us, to look out for our best interests. But on a much higher level, uh, we, we must learn to trust the Lord. And that's what he begins by saying in chapter 12 and verse 1. So it's about relationships. First, my relationship with God. Then he says from uh, verses 3 down through, oh, 15 or 16, my relationship with uh, each other, that I'm to love each other, uh, I am to serve one another. And then in verse 17 of the 12th chapter, uh, we'll look at it in a moment. He begins by talking about, well, let me just read it. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What? How, how good of advice is that? That's what I said last week. You don't, you don't interpret Romans 12. It interprets itself. I mean, you couldn't write it any plainer than it's been written. And verse 19, do not take revenge, my brothers, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, saith the Lord. So then he talks about how to deal with our enemies. And somebody says, well, I, I, don't, I don't have any enemies. Well, Jesus did. Paul did. John did. Peter did. If any man would live righteous in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so it's a given. If you stand for something, somebody's going to be against you. And so we'll look at that later on, Lord willing, in our studies to come. Because this 12th chapter is a gold mine. This 12th chapter tells us how to take learning and put it into living. And that's what he talked about in the very first words. He says, I urge you or I beg you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy. Now, God's mercy is the last, 12, uh, last 11 chapters. In view of God's 11 chapters of sinfulness, justification, sanctification, 
the struggle with the body, the gift of the Holy Spirit in us, living in us. Uh, Paul said that, that he could stand himself uh, separated from God for his brethren's sake, the Jewish nation, if they would just live. And then, then in chapter 10, he said, For I bear them knowledge, for they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They've got the zeal. They're out doing a bunch of stuff. They're doing duty, but they don't know what they're doing. And so that's the reason you bring the two together. You bring the 11 chapters. You get cognitively what he's saying. That's the mercies of God. Then he goes into the practical. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So then, you've got to get right with God first. You can't get right with each other. You can't get, how, can, how in the world can we deal with our enemies without God's help? Without doing it the way God said do it. And God said, leave some things unto me. Let me take care of some things. Don't, don't get in the revenge business. So you see, don't get in the business of getting even with people. You see how helpful this is? You see how beneficial it is? Because he tells us how to live the Christian life. We take our learning and put it into living. And I guess that's where we fumble the ball. That's where we just uh, struggle every day. And that's, that's some of the language here that's so important. Well, he starts out with one of the therefore. There are four therefores in the book of Romans, and all of them are there for a reason. Therefore, in view of, because of what's already been said, I, one translation says, I beg you, I beseech you, I urge you, brothers, listen to me very carefully. Paul is not ashamed to beg when it comes to salvation. And I think most of us have been raised on that statement, you know, well, I, I don't beg anybody. I ask them once or I ask them twice or I, uh, you know, I hinted around that they are. I, I don't beg. Paul did when it came to salvation. Some time ago, I was studying with an individual, and I, I said, uh, are you ready to do the Lord's will? And he said, yes. And I said, well, why have you waited so long? He said, because nobody's asked me. Wow. Nobody's asked you? Uh, you know, we, we, <laughs> we beg for other things that we really want, why is it so difficult for us? Well, I asked them one time. They said they, would, they were not interested. I talked to somebody the other day about, did you ask for a Bible study? Well, I asked them some couple of years ago, and they said they were not. They may have changed. Get this point very clearly, please. Paul was not ashamed to beg when it came to salvation. Why? Because that's the most important thing in the world is to be saved. And that most, the greatest tragedy in the world is to be lost. And so Peter says that the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering to you, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. He wants everybody. First Timothy 2, 4, who would have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so therefore, I beg you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, that's the last 11 chapters, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now then, the brethren at Rome were familiar with the Jewish practice of offering sacrifices and also the pagan when you get over to Romans chapter 14, you talk about the weak brother and the strong brother. And uh, then in the Corinthian letter, you have this discussion of eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Uh, that was a problem because uh, when they became a Christian, uh, 
And uh, could they buy meat that they, two years ago, had used it to sacrifice to an idol? They knew exactly what a living sacrifice is. Now, let me, let me make the point here very strongly. There have only been two living sacrifices in the Bible. One is Isaac, and the other is Jesus. One of the sweetest, most powerful stories in all the Bible is Genesis 22, when the Lord appeared to Abraham and told him to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to God. Now, that didn't make a bit of sense to us because Isaac was the first indication that God was going to keep his promise. Now, to keep his promise, he was going to make a great nation. He told him in Genesis 12 that he, that he would make a great nation. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed by your seed, by your uh, by your the children that will be born into the world. So when Isaac was born, then he was uh, after, I don't know, a certain age. What was he, 19, 20, 21 years old? Uh, God said, I want you to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. The Bible says I got up early in the morning. Did, I, did Abraham sleep the night before? When he's about to kill to offer as a sacrifice the only way God can keep his promise. It just doesn't make sense, does it? He just couldn't see any reason. And that's what faith is. Faith is when you can't see it. If you can see it, it's not faith. And so they get up early in the morning and they start their journey. And Abraham is made the prayer, he's done, he, and, and uh, Isaac has seen his daddy do this a thousand times or more. Dad, we've got everything. We've got the fire. We've got the wood. We've, you've got your knife, and where's the sacrifice? We, we didn't bring a, 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 a calf. We didn't bring a ram. We didn't bring an offering. Yes, we did. Notice what Abraham said. He said, God will provide. Wow. He sure does. God always provides. And so I've wondered, and I guess every father that has a son has wondered how this nearly this 100-year-old man could get a 20-year-old on an altar and strap him down. And what did he say to him? Well, I know what he said going up. He said, we will go yonder and worship, and we shall return. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I'm going to do what God says. And so after he had made that preparation to do what he'd done a thousand times with the ram, he had the knife in his hand, and he was about to kill the only way God could keep his commands. And the Bible says God stayed his hand. And don't you know that must have been a relief. So he untied him quickly, I guess, and he got him down off the altar. They found a ram that had been caught in the bushes there, and he offered that ram as a sacrifice to God. When they came down off that mountain, I don't know what they, I don't know if they high-fived, I don't know if they hugged each other, I don't know what they did, but I know one thing. I know Isaac knew that his daddy loved the Lord more than anything in this world. And that's the reason in the fourth chapter of Romans, he devotes so much attention to Abraham acting by faith and being justified by faith. And so that's the one living sacrifice. The other one is over in the gospel, uh, the gospel of Matthew. In, in, but really, John probably devotes more space to the crucifixion than any of the other three gospel writers. John talks about uh, in the upper room, you know, and, and, and what took place up there uh, when he told them that they would not partake of the Lord's Supper again to, until they did it with him in his kingdom. And then he said, let not your hearts be troubled. 
you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have, I would have told you. They were so visibly upset because Jesus had just said, I'm going back to the Father. <clears throat> I'm going back to the place I came. And, uh, and they said, uh, what are we going to do? Thomas said, we don't know the way. The most probably, the most significant verse of Scripture now in our lifetime is verse 6, when the Bible says very clearly, I, Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, was Jesus, is Jesus the only way? Does that sound like it? Or is he just like people are saying today, oh, there are many ways. Jesus is just one of them. That's not what he said. He said he was the only way. Acts 4.12, there's none other name given among men whereby you must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way. And so then we have two living sacrifices in the Bible. We have Isaac in Genesis 22, and we have Jesus in Matthew 26 and 27, and also in the book of John. So he says, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual act of worship. This is a way, to me, worship is being preoccupied with God. And when we come on the Lord's Day, collected, there's individual worship and then there's collective worship. Um, on Sunday morning, it's, uh, you know, the, the David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so then I think for our worship, this, this is talked about in John 4, 24, for God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth for it to be the worship that is needed. I think there needs to be preparation. I think we need to be, when after a while he talks about loving the Lord our, our, our God with our minds. I think we've got to get, we think that, that on Sunday, all we need to do is get our bodies in the building and we're worshiping. Now, where's your mind? Well, it's last week. It's next week. It's what I'm going to do when I get home. You know, we don't include our minds in worship like we should. How in, in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We can't, we can't even take communion without thinking. And with our thinking, we examine ourselves, not our neighbors, not our wife, our husband, or our children, or the people in front of me, or in back of me, but we examine ourselves. And then he said, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so then for worship, which is your spiritual act of worship, we're just talking about worship in general now. I think there needs to be preparation and then when we come together as a church, like in 1 Corinthians, he says, and when the whole church comes together, uh, it's on the Lord's Day, there must be participation. Uh, we just don't, we're just not spectators. And it, it bothers me. I, I think the reason we don't get more out of worship is because we don't put any more in it than we do. We just get up on Sunday morning, those of us who've done this all of our lives, we just get up and, on Sunday morning and get dressed and get to the building. And then when we get home, we feel like, well, I've done my duty this week. So that's it. That's not at all what the Lord talked about in John 4 when he said, such he seeks to be his worshipers, those who worship in spirit and in truth. And so then when we get there, there must be participation. We sing. When you visit the churches of Christ in your area, you'll find that it'll be a cappella. That is, that we sing the instrument we use is the heart, as the Bible so clearly teaches. And so we sing and make melody in our hearts unto the Lord. And therefore, we participate. Well, you, have you heard me sing lately? Well, that's the reason David said... Um, uh, make a joyful noise to the Lord, and that's what I do. But anyway, I participate with the prayer, with the singing, with the giving, with the 
the study of God's Word with the fellowship, Acts 2, 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, in prayer. And then thirdly, with worship, you've got to practice. And that's what I said a while ago about this matter of duty, uh, that we maybe are reg fairly regular in attendance, but what difference has it made? We maybe read our Bible often, hopefully. That's the reason we started out trying to encourage everybody to read the Bible through in 2018. Why? Because David said, Thy word have I stored up in my heart that I might not sin against you. So then that's the answer. When the devil was tempting the Lord in Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says that the Lord turned the devil away by saying, It is written, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is written, thou shalt not uh, make any other gods before me. And so then it's important that we understand this living sacrifice. Yeah, and you know the problem with this living sacrifice and getting up on the altar, as it were, we keep climbing down off the altar. And that's the reason it's got to be a daily thing. That we begin each day by saying, Lord, I'm going to present myself a living sacrifice. The, the Lord wants our body, the Lord wants our mind, and the Lord wants our will. And all of that's in the first three verses of Romans 12. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, that means separate apart, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then I'll begin it now, but I'll, Lord willing, when I get back, we'll pick up right here. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And that word transform is, a, is the word that we get our metamorphosis. It's like a cocoon turned into a gorgeous, beautiful butterfly. That's the same Greek word in this transformation. See, the world wants to control our minds. The Lord wants to transform our minds. He wants to change it from within. And so he says, don't, don't be conformed to this world. Moffat, in his commentary, says, don't let the world press you into its mold. Don't act like everybody else. Don't talk like everybody else. That, that's, that's been the problem with those of us who who are trying to get people to live for the Lord and be in the kingdom of God. They can't see any difference in us and the people in the world. The Lord says you're light and you're salt in the world. And so he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be you transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, by appealing to your will to get into the word to listen to God and to obey God and obey His Word. Our time is gone for now. We'll, Lord willing, pick up right here next time. Until then, may God bless you as our prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ, a place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ. We're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord.